This is the Sales Bible Podcast, episode 318, How to Use Podcasts for Business Development, an interview with Scott Ingram. Welcome to Sales Babble, the podcast that shares selling secrets for non-sellers. And now your host, Pat Helmers. Hello, sales babblers. This is Pat Helmers. Today, our guest is Scott Ingram. He's a host of the Sales Success Stories podcast and the Daily Sales Tips podcast. He's also the author of two books, Sales Success Stories and B2B Sales Mentors. He's a quota-carrying sales professional working for a professional services company. And in this episode, Scott shares ways you can grow authority, influence, and trust that attracts new business through podcasting. We're going to learn how to use podcasts for business development. This is an awesome topic because I believe, and you're probably not surprised by this, I believe that podcasting is the easiest way to become a thought leader with content that reaches your ideal buyers and grows your business. This is what my new podcasting agency, Abanero Media, is all about. When it comes to business development, trust is the tallest hurdle. With steep competition and a plethora of online choices, it's often easier to choose nothing. So when clients trust that you have their best interest at heart, they will accept your counsel. When you're an authority and influencer, buyers know you're the right choice for their company. Podcast Build Trust. So, with no further ado, let's get to it. Welcome, Scott. Are you ready to babble? Let's do it. You and I met last week. I think I reached out to you because you had posted something on LinkedIn. And uh, I remember you have a list of sales podcasts, which is a mile long. It, it is. I try to capture every active sales podcast I can find. And I've been keeping that list for about three years. And this last update it, it's about 217 shows. So there is no shortage of, of free sales content out there. That's for sure. I had no idea that there were so many sales podcasts out there because, well, I've been picked on the top 10 or the top 12 list like a number of times, like HubSpot does one and different people do one. So I thought, oh, maybe there's 20 out there. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea there were so many. Well, you you are in more rarefied air than you think, Pat. I guess I guess so. So, how is it that you came to this decision to like start collecting all of these all of these links? Well, so I, I started my own show. The first show I started a little over three years ago. So, the the list for me was I don't know, just really keeping a track of what else was going on out there. You know, my show's not for everybody. And I, I wanted to get a sense of of what else was out there and, and what niches people in. Or, I mean, gosh, there's there's a, a plumbing sales podcast. There's there's guys that talk about sports with their sales. And there's there's a little bit of, of something for, for everybody. So it's once I started it, I guess I just couldn't stop, right? I didn't want that list to get stale. And it's it's also amazing how many podcasts I've removed from the list. I, I also maintain an inactive sales podcast list where I, I just copy and paste the ones that used to be on the list uh, over just because they they haven't maintained. And, I, you know, I think the real game to so many things, podcasting in particular, but I think sales is like this, too. It's consistency and persistence goes a really, really long way. So like anything, you just have to decide that, you know, this is something I'm going to do and you just stick with it. Why, and why stop? I can't help but ask you a question. Why did you start a podcast on sales? <laughs> so the the first, I, I've started a few different podcasts. The, the first sales podcast I started is called Sales Success Stories. And my criteria for that show is also basically why I started it. I only interview active quota carrying individual contributors who are either the number one top performer in their company, or I always joke, I'm willing to settle for the top 1%. So if they, if they work for some giant organization and then they're, they're number two of 500, I'm willing to settle uh, for, for that level of performance. And I did that because there are so many, not just podcasts, but so much of the content in sales, all of the books, all of the, the webinars, all this stuff out there comes from 
uh, what, what I will call the sales gurus, the sales experts who haven't actively been in a selling role and had a quota in, in years and oftentimes decades. And I, I thought, you know what? Sales is evolving at, at a rapid pace. And actually, I don't think it's really sales that's evolving. I think it is, I, I don't know, just life. Like the, the way that we experience life with all of the different distractions and things that are coming at us that impact our day-to-day -day work, our day-to-day -day just life experience, that's changing. And I wanted to hear how the very best were not only dealing with that, but performing in that environment. What are they doing differently? What are they doing better to achieve that level of success? Not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago, but right now. That's really exciting <laughs> for me because I found it very challenging to get quota carrying salespeople to come here on Sales Babel. Either they're too busy or they're afraid their boss may find out. <laughs> They're afraid they might be give up some trade secret. Uh, there's a lot of fear in these people, and um, and and I, I could totally identify with that. Yeah, you know, I I think I I kind of got lucky with that criteria because part of what comes with being number one in the organization is is you have probably more job security than just about anybody else. So I, I think that they have a little bit more license and leeway. It's, it's very unlikely that they're going to get fired. And and every now and then, you know, I, I will get uh, a, a PR team involved. In fact, I just did an episode last week where, where we are having, there was one of my questions that they asked that I not ask. And we are having to run the final edit by their, by their PR team real quick before we release it. But, you know, other than having to have jumped through those couple of extra hoops a couple of times, most, most of the time, I actually find that it's those top performers who have benefited the most from this lifelong study and, and research and just honing their craft. And they're, Contrary to what a lot of people think, they're the most willing to give back and, and pay it forward. And, and a lot of times I think of and I talk to them about my show being mentoring at scale, you know, because they get asked to have this conversation that I have with them over and over and over again by other folks in their organization. And I tell them, look, you can have it with me once and just send people to go listen to the podcast and you can stop taking these coffee meetings. <laughs> I love it. So what comes out from this? It's almost like you're doing a research study here. What are the common, what, what the common factors that you're seeing that these people have that other salespeople uh, lack? Yeah, that it's a it's a fascinating study. So I mean, and it's not it's certainly not detailed or scientific or or anything like that. I'm I'm not a researcher. It's called sales success stories, not sales success statistics, or you know, or, or anything along those lines. It's it's certainly more anecdotal than than that. But there certainly are some some large overarching themes. And I think we already talked about one of them. You know, one of them is just this idea of they tend to be consummate learners. They're in, and not just about sales, but about their customers and about their marketplace. And they're really developing in themselves to be true experts in their space. And I, I find that there's also there's a lot of myth busting, I, I think that, that goes on because with, if you picture right now, picture the best salesperson at a, at a given company, I, I think we would apply a lot of pretty negative traits to them. We, we would think that, that they're only out for themselves and they're, you know, they'll, they'll run over anybody to, to get a deal. And, and I've actually found the exact opposite. I find that they care more than anybody else about outcomes. Right. They, they are really digging in deep with their clients and trying to find ways to serve them. And and to the point where it's it's kind of obsessive. Right. That's really what's driving them. And it's it's one of those things where when you do that, you you, you don't have to worry about the money and the commissions. They come if you serve people well and help them get what they want. It's, it goes back to that old Zig Ziglar quote that you'll get everything you want in in return. So that's that's one of the big themes that I see. The the other thing just very broadly is there is no recipe 
there is no secret bullet. There's there's no single path or or even unified path that these folks are on. It's really they have gone about studying this and researching this and trying so many different things and they've really assembled their own process and their own way that fits who they are and the way that they work and and it's certainly tuned to their marketplace and their clients and the types of personas that they do business with and all you know again all of those things sort of come together uh to create greatness it's almost like that paradigm, the idea that you've jumped out of the airplane and you're building your parachute on the way down, that they're, they're building this as they go. There's no set path for, for what they've done before. Well, I, and I think that's kind of always been true in sales. I mean, there's, there's very few places you can go anymore, fewer and fewer, I believe, where you get really great in-depth sales training. I, I think the more common experience is here's the internet, here's a phone, make sales. <laughs> you know, it's, it's no different than, you know, 20 years ago, it was, here's a yellow pages and, and, and here's a desk and a phone and, and go make it happen. There's, there's not, I think we've all at some level had to figure this out on our own. And yeah. even if there are those formalized processes or, or formalized training and education, you still have to find a way to make that your own. It, they don't, they're not amazing out of the box. They take a, a lot of practice and, and tuning. It's, it's kind of like, you know, taking a, a, a suit off the rack, you know, and like, yeah, it might look okay, but it's, it's the tailoring and really making that fit that makes it look a, a thousand times better than it does off the rack. You see, this is, I, I totally I can identify with this. This is one of the biggest complaints people have with CRMs is that they're not customized. They're, they're, that they're off the rack. They're not made to fit me. They're not made to fit the processes in the industry that I'm in. Do you, do you really want to push my, my CRM soapbox buttons? Cause that's, that's a whole tirade in and of itself. Oh, is it? Tell me more. <laughs> here's so here's here's my issue with CRM and I'll I'll try and keep this as as simple and straightforward as I can. I believe that CRMs have been designed for the people who buy the CRMs, which is the sales leadership. Right? And so it's designed to bring together this data and and help them uh, uh to forecast and and understand what their teams are doing. It's not designed to serve the sales professional that's using it day in and day out. They're not designed to make them better at their job and make their job easier. And if, if we, and the challenge that sales leaders then have is they don't have enough data in the system to get what they bought it for, to get all of that rich data and, and great, accurate forecasting information. I believe if, if we flipped this around, and we built a great CRM that made the sailor better, that really served them, that, that in a lot of ways automatically brought in the data that they needed. Because I'll tell you, in, in Salesforce, I've used Salesforce, I can't tell you how many times in, in different organizations. It's, it's, I don't know, eight, 10 clicks for me to make a call leave a note that, you know, the most, the most common thing that happens when any of us make a call is we probably get voicemail. We don't actually even get the person live. So all I'm trying to do is let the system know, Hey, I made a call. I left a voicemail and I want to make sure that I, I follow up in another couple of days or tomorrow or whenever that is. Right. That is an ungodly number of clicks in Salesforce to do just that simple task. Why isn't that one click? Cause that's what happens. 70% of the time I pick up the phone. Yes. Yes. So no wonder you don't have accurate data because I'm on to the next call. That's much more productive than me taking all this silly time to log that activity. Yes. Yep, 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 yep. All right. I'm off the, I'm off my CRM soapbox. Let's talk about something else. <laughs> As a sales manager, I love Salesforce <laughs> personally. <laughs> One of the things, um, one, one of the reasons I want to have you on there is because you are a podcaster and I'm in the podcasting business these days. Um, I, th I really believe in podcasting. 
I believe it's a great way to get your brand across. It's a great way. It's, it's the new blogging, um, which is why I asked you the question of like, why did you start a podcast? Ult- ultimately, the reason was if, if I if I pull this all the way back, it is the oh, oh gosh, I've, I've forgotten uh, Jim Rohn. That's who's, who I'm trying to think of. Mm-hmm. Jim Rohn has this quote that I've seen my entire career and, and you've probably heard it, too. And it is this idea that you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. And we've all heard that or most of us have heard that. And yet. I'd never really fully acted on that. I, I never consciously went out to surround myself with really great people that were going to help me take my game to the next level. And so that's really what the show was about. It, it was a tool for me to develop relationships. And, you know, I, I talk to a lot of folks that are starting podcasts or thinking about starting podcasts these days. And there's a lot of podcasts. I mean, heck there's 217 sales podcasts, but what's the, the way you need to think about this. If you, if you're going to start a podcast, I think the wrong way to think about it. And the typical way to think about it is what kind of reach am I going to get? How big of an audience can I build? I, I think that stuff is gravy. That's bonus. If that happens, amazing. The real value of the podcast, it is the ultimate networking and relationship building tool. Yes. Yes. How, how do you use it? How do you use it to do that? Well, I'll have to tell you about a different podcast to, to do that uh, appropriately. So I, I started in my day job. I carry a, a $3.2 million quota. Uh, I am a quota carrying sales professional myself. And I, I, I work for a professional services firm that works in the, the Oracle marketing cloud space. And I started a show shortly after joining that organization called Inspired Marketing. And I wanted to build a show for my prospects for my clients. But again, it it's basically irrelevant to me whether or not anybody listens to the show. It was more about the excuse to engage in great conversations. Yep. And if you if you pull up that show, I've done I've lost track of of how many interviews, probably 60 some some interviews, and the vast majority of them are with Fortune 500 marketers. And my acceptance rate on cold outreach related to the podcast is somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 to 80%. Because unlike the traditional cold call or cold outreach, that's all about me and what I'm trying to get. This is all about them. I'm trying to give them a platform to share their story and something that they're proud of and something that they've accomplished. And that, that's what people want, right? It's, it's, it's about them. It's about building their own uh, personal brand. And so that, that process has opened incredible, incredible doors. And, and we've brought on many new clients uh, through that process and, and been able to elevate uh, many of our existing clients uh, and let them talk about the stories and the successes that they've been able to have uh, working with, with us and, and the things that they have accomplished. And is, isn't, don't we all like talking about our success and the, and the great things that we've done? I'm really glad you brought this up because when I was at podcast movement last summer, I met a guy who I'm trying to get on the podcast right now. That's exactly what he was doing. He didn't care how many downloads he had, but he, it gave him an opportunity to talk to people who wouldn't have spoken with him otherwise. And they eventually become clients. It's just, that's just brilliant. It's just awesome. Well, and if, if you think about the process, there it, it leads to at least three good conversations, right? Because now the, the, once, once they agree to talk to me about it, we have sort of an initial conversation and we get to talk about, well, what are we going to talk about, right? What's, what's, <laughs> what's the focus? What's that project that you're, you're really proud of that, that we can shine a, a spotlight on? So that's one conversation. And then there's the actual interview. And Pat, I, I know you've seen this having been a podcaster as, as long as you have. The magic happens 
before and after we press the record button, particularly after. And, and a couple of the questions that I ask are around uh, some challenges that they may have faced over the over the course of of this initiative that they were working through, and then I also get to ask, okay, well, this, this is amazing, Pat. You've you've had all of this success in what you've done. Well, what's next? What's what's what are you what are you taking on right now? And two things happen invariably every time I finish the official interview. And again, these are big Fortune 500 executives, so they they tend to be very guarded in what they're saying publicly on a recorded podcast that that I'm going to release and share. So the first thing they'll say is, "Scott, here's here's the part of of that story I couldn't talk about publicly because I don't know what it is. They just feel compelled to to fill in the dots and and." just kind of talk shop about what was really going on in, in that situation. But they're like, they would never say that, you know, outside of, of a, you know, in, in a public audience. And then the next thing they, they say was, well, wait a minute. I just talked about this big project we're, we're starting to work on. Is that what you guys do? And it leads to the most natural sales conversation you can ever imagine. And then the next conversation we get to have is I'm reaching out to congratulate them because we've just released their podcast. And and now we've got them they're on, you know, Apple Podcasts and they're on Spotify and they're on all the all the great podcast places and they're on our blog and you know all of these things are happening. It's it's absolutely incredible stuff and again, because it's always about them, I think it creates that dynamic of they they want to be able to reciprocate well, this is what I do. And so I now have an opportunity to help them yet again. Interesting enough, that's how I've been getting, I've gotten sponsors on Sales Babble. Is I, like I had Craig Klein, who's a sponsor of Sales Babble. He was a guest and we just started talking afterwards about um, about his business and how he was marketing it. And I said, well, you ever think about, ever think about sponsoring a podcast? And he goes, well, you know, I haven't. <laughs> and next thing you know, he's sponsoring us. That's right. That's right. It, it, you know, there's there's just something about it's so intimate. You know, you're that that conversation, both both from a, an interview perspective, but also for for the audience perspective. In in what other medium are you literally inside of people's heads? Yes, literally inside their heads. Yes, and and you, you know, you you just you get an opportunity to get a sense of somebody and and know what they're about, and you get all of that inflection and passion and and if that connects and resonates it's it's so natural to to go to that next step and it has none of the bias that goes with video <laughs> oh no video is scary i mean i i think we all hate the way we sound i think we we all suffer from that but video is even worse <laughs> and it's just it, it's a lot harder to manage there's a lot more overhead and he, he, what i really love about podcasts because I, I i just i love podcasts for for all kinds of reasons and i i listen to many of them as well it's the it's really the only medium that you can do or or consume while the rest of your body is busy so if, if the rest of my body body is busy driving a car or working out i can't watch a video Right. But I can listen to a podcast. You sure can. You sure can. Well, I love it. You and I are violently agreeing with each other here. And um... <laughs> we just... <laughs> do, we, do we need to have some more controversy? Do, you, do we need to poke the bear here? What, what can we disagree on? But, but, but before we finish this up, you're, you're a part of a few podcasts. Maybe you could walk through the list so that people could go find them. Yeah, sure. So, so the one that again, it's it's very niche and specific to kind of our Oracle Marketing Cloud audience is the Inspired Marketing Podcast. We talked about sales success stories where I interview top performing sales professionals. But I realized about a year ago that the two best things about that show were also the two worst things about that show. So, one, obviously, my criteria is super strict, and it precludes me to talking to amazing individuals like, well, Pat yourself would would be a great example. And I think it's it's super intimidating for folks who don't know what they're getting into because my average episode is something like 75 minutes. So if you pull up that podcast and you're confronted with I mean, the, the interview that I'll release next is an hour and 45 minutes. That's a lot if, if you don't really know the value of what that is. And I think maybe scares some people away. So about a year ago, I started the exact opposite show called Daily Sales Tips. 
and true to its name, every single day, seven days a week, I release a new sales tip, but it's not just me. I, I bring a lot of different voices onto that show to share their actionable insights and advice and, and practices and things that have worked for them. And it's, it's been an amazing experience uh, that that particular show and is, has really caught on actually today. Uh, as I look at it, it is the number one sales podcast on Spotify. That's awesome. I downloaded the list. I've not done one yet, but um, my, my we're going to fix that. <laughs> I'll get to that. It's on my list. It's on my list. So that, no, that's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. Absolutely. Scott, I really appreciate you visiting here on sales babble. This has been great. This has been fun. I, I enjoyed uh, our, our babbling together. I'll make sure and put all this stuff in the show notes so that people can find your podcast. Uh, thank you for visiting us. My pleasure, Pat. Anytime. Sales babble is sponsored by Abanero media a podcasting agency for B2B brands. Podcasting is the easiest way to turn your executives into thought leaders with content that reaches your ideal clients. Haven't you heard that podcasting is the new blogging? Start a podcast today. Go to abaneromedia.net. That's abanero with an H like the hot pepper. It's a hot idea. Go to abaneromedia.net and start podcasting today. One of the questions I often ask, are you setting aside time to write blogs and to find topics while running your business? Are you certain that buyers are even reading what you're producing? Is it clear that your content rings true? Do your peers and clients see you as a definitive expert in the industry? Are you seen as a change maker, a visionary leader? Are you recognized by the press and professional organizations as the go-to guy in your industry? If not to any of these, podcasting might be a solution to all life's problems. Yes, I'm biased. <laughs> but so are you to a certain degree, right? You're listening to a podcast. You understand the power that podcasts can bring to, to a person. So, um, so that's why I love this conversation with Scott. Really, really, really great stuff. Um, to find links to his podcast, you can find them in the show notes here at www.salesbabble.com slash 318. And if you like this podcast, it would be terrific if you could give us a five-star review in whatever podcast app that you're, that you're listening to this, this at this time. That would be great. Don't forget, on Thursday, we'll be doing the Sales Babble Telebabble. Starts 4 o'clock Central Time. That's 5 Eastern, 2 Pacific time. I'll be sending out an email for anybody on the email autoresponder so that you can put that on your calendar. And also put a calendar reminder in the show notes for today. That's all I've got for this week, folks. Take care and have a highly successful and a profitable selling day. <music>